How are you doing? Good. How's it going? Absolutely fantastic. I always wondered what would happen to the world when Dick Clark and Casey Kasem pass their energy forward, and and I think you're it because you, you're telling you're into telling stories, dude. And and I love this about your book. Thank you so much. And that's a great compliment because those are two. It's funny. I will still listen on occasion yep. to America's Top Forty. Yeah. Like when they replay it, uh, you know, when I hear the replays of it, because look, man, Casey Kasem was just one of the great voices of all time. And, and and storyteller as well, because, I mean, I would sit there as a kid and I wanted to know the stories behind, you know, Earth, Wind and Fire with September and things like that. And, and it gave me information and it fed my my desire to be in radio. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I would imagine that, you know, I mean, look, it's like these stories that connect you. I mean, I think about, oh, my God, the, um, you know, like those long distance letters. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Dude, the uh, um, in, in 1988, I was up to replace Casey on American Top 40 because he was leaving to go do his own thing. And and the thing about it is, though, is that I tried to read it like Casey, and I think I messed up my life because of that. I should have just went on there as me and not me trying to tell the stories like Casey. Well, exactly, because no one could ever be Casey. No, no. Not even it's the funny. emotion. Cameron Crowe wrote the forward to my book. Mm -hmm. Cameron has become a good friend. Dude, if I mean, you can never be Cameron, of course, in three, like as a kid, I imagined that because, you know, I remember seeing Fast Times at Ridgemont High in the movie theater at like 13 years old, thinking it was the coolest thing in the world. Yep. And no freaking clue that one day this guy would be texting me photos of his dog. But it's because I'm not trying to be if I tried to be Cameron. It would fail miserably. Yep, yep, so true. So let me ask you a question, Steve. I, I, I'm blessed with the opportunity to talk with a lot of these creative minds. But when I, uh, when I mention the thing that it, it's an anthem song, this is the kind of song we're all going to be singing back to you louder than you're giving it to us, they kind of just shrug it off. Why is it that they, is, is it some sort of curse that they don't want to walk into? It's because they have no clue. And okay. that's really the point of this book is that, look, when you, once you release a song, it's not yours anymore. And so for a lot of the times, they would go back and have no idea what the song had even done. It's it's the way I likened it, right? Artists will always tell you so they can't choose a favorite song because it's like choosing a favorite child. Well, so when your kid goes off in the world and does their own thing, you have no control over it. You hope for the best, but you have no control. Like, it's really funny. You know, I talked with Barry Manilow for this book for Could It Be Magic? <laughs> and I was talking about all the international versions. And he's like, I had no idea. He's like, I'm going to go listen to all those. I didn't know that it had been covered in all these languages. And Rod Stewart's become a friend, and I'm working on the follow-up, and we talked about Tonight's the Night, and I'm telling him about how influential that song was and how it had been number one for eight weeks, which was at the time was the longest yep, number one yep, yep. since Hey Jude, and it was the number one song in 1977. And he goes to me, he's like, where are you reading all this? And he added it back into his set. They don't know. A lot of times they have no idea what happens with the song. It's not like they sit there and say, okay, it's in this movie now, or, oh, it's in this TV show. Oh, you know, Weezer covered it because Weezer covered multiple <laughs> songs in this book. Right. <laughs> they, they knew what they were doing. They know exactly what they're doing, Weezer. Yeah. Weezer knew exactly what they were doing. But I trust me, when Toto wrote Africa, they had no freaking clue. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and, and Steve would, will tell you that, well, thank you for uh, you know, re-releasing it because it just, it, you know, it put more people in our seats. Oh, exactly. They said that song, you know, Weezer covering that song gave a total new life. All these songs had new life, whether it was through covers, like Tears for Fears talk about the fact they loved, even though that song was already iconic, mm -hmm. Everybody Wants to Rule the World, they loved Lord's cover so much that they actually used that at their lead-in music at the show. <laughs> they played her version of Everybody Wants to Rule the World from Hunger Games, and then would do their version as the opening song of the set because they thought she did such a great job. Or, of course, songs get used in movies, like Let the Sun Shine, Fifth Dimension, Age of Aquarius, Let yes. the Sunshine. That was in 40-Year-Old Virgin, you know? So when a song is in a movie like that, of course it becomes massive. When, when you've got a song like that from the Fifth Dimension, because we, we learned that when I was in the seventh grade in, in, in middle school, and, and, was, and that's how I was introduced to a lot of popular music, because I had, I had a music teacher that had enough courage and guts to say, we're not singing that old crap, you're, you're going to sing the new stuff. So, like, which songs, for example? Uh, anything from the Beatles. 
anything. Um, I'll never forget, I'll tell you, Bohemian Rhapsody. We, we as a chorus at Riverside Junior High School, we mastered that. And, and the kid that, uh, that, that sang Freddie's part was just, we, we were all so jealous of him because A, he got the attention from the teacher, and B, he had a voice. I mean, a voice. Yeah, it's funny. That song, that's a song that's interesting to me. And unfortunately, you know, I did reach out to Queen, but it's funny. If I could have gotten Queen in this book, it would not have been Bohemian Rhapsody. Really? Because for the same reason that Carly Simon and I discussed anticipation versus You're So Vain, at some point you talked about it so much, yep. you get sick of talking about it. And it's not a question of, you know, the song not being great. It's just like, come on, what else am I going to say? But with Bohemian yeah. Rhapsody, I think back to being a kid in the 70s, right? The two definitive rock anthems of all time at that point, Stairway to Heaven and Freebird. And I have spoken <laughs> to Leonard Skinner about Freebird for the next book. But Bohemian Rhapsody over time, and again, we talked about movies, look at Wayne's World. Mm -hmm. I mean, that changed the trajectory of that song forever. And and when and when you change a song like that, I mean, even I mean, first of all, the very fact that they even let uh, um, you know him in the movie Bohemian Rhapsody. I mean, it's just I loved it because it, it was like they symbolized him or said, "Hey, hey, thank you for doing this." Yeah, and it's funny because I remember having a similar experience with David Bowie, Young Americans, with my friends in our car. You know, we were driving around, and you hear that song, and it's the same thing. There are certain songs when they come on, like in Young Americans. When it goes to that port, where, that that port, that point, mm -hmm. where it's like, you know, do you remember your president? And I'm not singing it because you will lose every listener right away. <laughs> but when it gets to that, do you remember your president Nixon, dude? I don't care if you are sitting there solving the meaning of life. You shut the f up. Yep. And you let David Bowie sing. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, I. I I'll tell you one thing that, that I grew up doing is I always thought that there was a war between the Beatles and the Beach Boys. And in your book, Anthems We Love, I mean, you really paint the picture that Paul McCartney had some Beach Boy songs that he really liked. But not only was there not a war, I mean, look, Paul McCartney has said that Sgt. Peppers was influenced yep. by Pet Sounds. The two of them really fed off each other because those were the geniuses of the time more than anybody else because dylan obviously was a genius at the time but he was doing something different and the stones were much harder edge neither the beatles nor the beach boys were going to do anything like give me shelter so the stones were off in their own world so the <laughs> beatles and the beach boys who were doing you know look you can see the similarities between a song like good vibrations and some of the beatles stuff at that time like good vibrations and uh strawberry fields mm -hmm. Would you say that Don McLean's American Pie is probably one of the very fewest songs to have so many multiple song hooks? You can go anywhere in this song and be hooked to it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's funny because someone asked me about the fact that, you know, that song, there was an edited version. And of course, Don McLean yeah. talks at length about the fact that there could be no edited version. He wasn't going to have that. It was going to have to be the full version, similar to The Doors with Light My Fire. But with McLean, look, that song is carefully constructed in the same way i did a piece for forbes a couple of years ago i'm an english major or i was an english major i'm a proud music geek and i started to think about the greatest song ever written and after thinking about it to me the greatest song ever written is leonard cohen hallelujah oh my because god yes every single line in that song is poetry but the reason i mention that is american pie is the same thing every every part like a poem is so carefully designed. If you take out one piece, the song doesn't work the same way. Wow. Would you say that it, in, with this book, Anthems We We Love, are you an archaeologist or are you giving birth to new ideas of discovery so people can go on the web and, and, and find out exactly what you are putting in detail? I think it's both. Because again, it's up to the artist to tell the story. So mm -hmm. I'm really letting them tell the story because look, <laughs> it's not my place to speak for people as great as Brian Wilson or Tom Waits. It's my place to be lucky enough to speak to them, to have relationships with them and to tell the stories. But in some instances, and they trust me because they know I'm a fan and because I love this stuff and because I've known them for years. But in some instances, there's really new information coming out, like the Carly Simon chapter. I was with a friend of mine from the music industry yesterday who was saying he's known Carly for 40 years. He had no idea that she started playing because Cat Stevens yeah. invited her to open for him and she had a big crush on him. And look, the details she talks about playing, writing You're So Vain while waiting on a date for Cat Stevens.
some instances, there's definitely new information. And in a lot of instances, it is sort of being an archaeologist. For me, look, like there's songs in here. There's obvious anthems, Light My Fire, Walk This Way, Rock and Roll All Night. And then there's songs like The Spinners, I'll Be There, that's just one of my favorite songs. And so, of course, the hope is that someone says, oh, wow, I'm reading this book because I love this song. But crap, I didn't even know about The Spinners. I definitely have to check that out. Or Tom Waits. I mean, if you know, and again, I've said this so many times, but it's true. Because look, for me, that's my favorite songwriter in the world. Most general people know his songs, but they maybe don't know him because they know the covers of like the Eagles Old 55, of course, Springsteen Jersey Girl. But I can tell you, man, when you mention Tom Waits to another artist, they lose their freaking mind. They do. They do. They absolutely do. And then all of a sudden you start to hear their stories, their connections, why and how they became into what they did and everything like that. And, and, and to me, that's that's one of those pages in music history that it's like, I don't want it to become as popular as everything else. I want I want Mr. Waite to have his own place where we can discover him as individuals. Well, it's funny because, I mean, to me, that's the greatest thing that there is in music. Like I had a friend pass along to me, Nick Drake. I didn't mm. know who the hell Nick Drake was. I'm obsessed now. One of my favorite, and I've interviewed Joe Boyd about Nick Drake. No, Joe Boyd was Nick Drake's producer, for those who don't know. And I've interviewed him about Nick several times. But again, there's still nothing like having a song passed on to you from someone you trust. And hopefully, that's what this book becomes for people. Because yeah. it's funny, My Chemical Romance shared it oh on Instagram the other day. Gerard Way has been a friend for years. He's one of the nicest guys in music. They shared it. Instagram, like, it tripled that day for Anthems We Love. And so, as I said, I posted the table of contents and I'm like, Gerard loves all these songs. So I hope that if you came to this only because of my cam, you go back and listen to some of this other stuff. So now when, when you're having these conversations with those that have written it and performed it and stuff like that, is, is there a go-to energy level where you know that you can get on the inside of their heart to get that? Because what will happen is I'll, I'll, I'll do a thing and I'll, I'll just go, okay, let's break it down. The Temptations, My Girl, two different hits here. R&B, and it was a beach song in the South. And all of a sudden, then it opens up the door for people to go, he just took a big breath. All right, we're having a conversation right now. I mean, there were definitely standard questions. Usually everything is just, you know, um, I unscripted conversation. The last time I wrote questions for an interview, Aretha Franklin in 2007, because they asked me to do it, and I was like, fine, it's Aretha, I'll do it. I never do this, but I will do it for Aretha wrote it out, get on the phone with her. I was like, well, I know you've seen the questions. And she goes, I haven't seen the questions. You can ask me whatever the hell you want. And I was like, okay, never writing out questions ever again for an interview. And I never did. So it's usually, but with this book, mm -hmm. because there were certain things I was looking for, there were standard questions I went to. When did you first play the song live? Do you remember the response to it? Things of that nature. Because I very much did not want to do another book about songwriting. Right. So a lot of it had to do with, audience reaction to the song. When did you notice it start to become an anthem? When did you start to notice that it was taking on a life of its own? That was a big thing. Have you ever gotten with Hootie and the Blowfish and talked with Darius Rutger? Because I, I asked him one time about how, uh, you know, why, why do you play cover songs? He says, people react to them. Dude, they react to them. They know the words. You've got to pull them back in. I love Hootie. Yes, and I've spoken to Darius a few times. It's funny. I mean, I would totally put a song like Only Want to Be With You in a future book. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are just great songs. But yeah, it's interesting, of course, you talk with any artist, right? And you do cover songs. And yet also, though, the artists have their own sort of history with the song. So the song means something to them. And it's very fascinating to talk with artists about cover songs. I remember years ago, excuse me, interviewing Brian Ferry, who I love, about doing a Dylan cover album. Mm. And he talked about the fact, look, there are songs that maybe I love. I couldn't do them. They didn't work for me. Like, my voice did not work for them. Mm. So the art of a cover song is really fascinating. Gene Simmons is known for uh, t uh, telling people, you know, today's rock and roll is prostitution rock and roll. Now, come on now. When you, when you go back and listen to rock and roll all night, you can't be any more simple than that song. And, man, it has been an, an anthem. Well, that's it's funny. I have interviewed now over two books. Right. I've interviewed like 70 something artists on the greatest songs of all time, including now I'm talking about the future books as well. Freebird, give me some love and right. say you want to be a rock and roll star. The point is, look, the only person in two books to say that they set out to write an anthem was Paul Stanley of Kiss. Wow. And he says it's because Neil Bogart of Casablanca Records, yep. a very famous 70s music figure, 
told him he had to write an anthem. So that's the only reason. It wasn't like he said, oh, man, I want an anthem. But he tells, look, that song, you can't do it. You can't predict it. That song didn't become an anthem for at least three years till it was on the live album when audiences start to hear everybody screaming along, <laughs> I want to rock and roll all night and party every day. And then they want to become part of the Kiss Army. Yep. So even when you set out to write an anthem, you can't control it. You have no say in it. <laughs> well, Neil Sean's the same way with, uh, you know, I mean, with, with the music of Journey. It's like he goes, I, you know, dude, I, I, we wrote songs. You guys happen to do your job on your side of the speaker. We just wrote songs. Yeah, no, it's funny because I spoke with Neil for the next book and I let him choose the song and he shocked me. He chose Lights. Really? Which oh, is well, a great I, song, I get but... it. Yes, I, I, I'll agree with him on that. Yes. Yeah, but it's funny because it's not the most famous Journey song, but absolutely, it's iconic. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, too, artists have relationships with their songs that's different than anybody else. So in Anthems We Love, I spoke with Lindsey Buckingham of Fleetwood Mac and I would have personally chosen Go Your Own Way. But he chose Big Love because that was the song that sort of is right at the time that he was leaving Fleetwood Mac. And that song became the transition to his solo career. Mm -hmm. And you know what, though? I got to tell you something. I am more of a Lindsey Buckingham fan from his last album, the one he just released maybe six, seven months ago, because all of a sudden I'm hearing him do some different things with Christine McVie. Oh, he's amazing. And it's funny, I, he's also, I mean, I've been such a fan for so long, yeah. and he's one of the great guitar players in the world. I could watch the guitar solo for I'm So Afraid every <laughs> single night. That that solo never gets old. It's live to me. It's one of like the great solos in the world. Um, what Shania Twain. I mean, I was I was a little shocked to see her in there. I mean, I, I mean, she's had her impact and stuff like that, but I always thought that radio cheated because radio just jumped on her. Like, it's like, play her, play her, and then all of a sudden it was Taylor Swift. Well, Shania is one of my favorite chapters in the book because she's so honest with it. But it's funny because I love the fact that this coincided with, you know, uh, Harry Styles, mm -hmm. Rod, who I'm a big fan of, actually. I Me think too. he really gets music mm -hmm. and huge fan of his. He brought her out for Coachella and she's getting that accolade that maybe, look, was long overdue, like you say. And maybe people forgot about her because she wasn't always in the limelight and she's had rough periods and she talks in the book about the fact that you're still the one was written for mutt lang mm -hmm. who then cheated on her and married her best friend and so she's very open about how she had to reclaim that song and she did so through other people's memories of it and it's funny though because i meet like a lot of rock fans who you know 20 something 30 something year old women who freaking love her and they may not be country fans but they love her so she's been influential in ways that have maybe been hidden so if people recognize the fact that look she is a freaking icon. Yep. Great. Wow. Congratulations on this book. I could talk to you all day. And so that means that we're going to be like uh, Joe Elliott. You're going to come back to this show nine more times. Okay. Uh, I'd be honored to. I love Joe. He is one of my favorite <laughs> oh my people. God. Photograph is in the next book. He's an amazing guy. Yeah. And oh, man. So, you know. He can just sit and geek out on all the young dudes for 24 <laughs> hours. That's so true. Well, you be brilliant today, okay? Thanks so much, man. Thanks for having me.